Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers? Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Monday. I did not do a recap episode over the weekend on the dismissal for Alec Baldwin. I figured everybody heard about it pretty quickly, and I took that time of not having trial to cover to hang out with my youngest, so it all worked out. We're going to recap that now, though. Before we get started, if you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if you want notifications of when I post new content. Just click that little bell icon. Music fact of the day, the song, The Sounds of Silence by Simon and Garfunkel. How did Paul Simon come up with that awesome opening line? Hello, darkness, my old friend. Paul said he used to go sit in the dark in the bathroom alone to write songs at his guitar, and that's how he came up with that opening line. I have to say, I've done this podcast for over four years now, and I don't think I've ever covered a day in court like I did Friday, and y'all, that is saying something. It was such a mess. I think on Thursday, we all had a feeling this might be a big deal when we found out that there were rounds turned in that the defense wasn't made aware of. Friday, the judge sent the jurors home very early when she obviously realized this was going to be a big deal. Some of the things that I've never seen is the prosecutor, Ms. Johnson, who delivered the opening statements, she quit that morning. At one point, the judge comes off the bench, puts on gloves, interacts with evidence and crime scene technician Marissa Popple. The prosecutor, Ms. Morrissey, she demands to testify and puts herself on the stand, even though at this point, the defense really was like, we're good. We don't need you on the stand. I think they knew they were about to have this case dismissed, but she insisted. Back to the prosecutor quitting the case that morning. Prosecutor Morrissey said the reason that Ms. Johnson quit is because she did not agree with the decision to have the hearing in public. But Ms. Johnson said she resigned over not learning these rounds were turned in and not given to the defense until we, the public, did. She found out along with us. It was really clear that this judge was not happy that whole day. So how did it happen? And a lot of people have asked, he's not charged with being the one to bring live ammunition on set. But the thing is this, the state and the defense have to hand over all evidence to each other. The defense went so far as to say that the prosecution buried this evidence. They gave the example. It was not put in with the other rust evidence, and it was given a different file number, which really makes no sense. And it really just made sure this evidence would not be stumbled upon by anybody. Marissa Popple was on the stand again on Friday, and she confirmed she put it under a different file number as she was instructed to do so. And the thing is this, the state, they don't get to look at evidence and say what's important and what's not. The prosecutor, Ms. Morrissey, said she visually inspected those rounds and concluded they weren't similar, but she's not a ballistics expert. That's not her call to make. Further, when Corporal Hancock, the lead investigator, was asked under oath if the prosecutor, Ms. Morrissey, was in on that conversation to give this a different file number and not put it in with the rest of the Russ evidence? She said yes. Now, I had friends in the courtroom and they said, you really can't hear it on the feed. There were gasps in the courtroom when she said that. We talked about this first being brought up on Thursday when Alec Baldwin's defense attorney asked CSI technician Marissa Popple if a good Samaritan brought the rounds to the courthouse and then later to the sheriff's office. Troy Teske, who is a friend of Hannah Gutierrez Reed's father, as well as a retired police officer and judge, said that these would match the fatal bullets that killed Miss Hutchins. The first time he tried to turn these in was at the end of Hannah Gutierrez Reed's trial, the armorer, who was found guilty and sentenced to 18 months for involuntary manslaughter. At the time, Corporal Hancock, the lead investigator, was working on Hannah's trial and was not able to meet with him. Mr. Teske was actually on the witness list by the defense in Hannah's trial, but they never called him to the stand. On Friday, the judge had Marissa Popple take the stand again. After some back and forth, she admitted that her superior asked her to put the ammunition under a different case number. They call Seth Kinney, the PDQ props owner and the supplier of ammunition to the rust set to the stand. He reiterated that he didn't give live rounds to the set. They go back to the project that he was working on with Hannah's dad, Thel Reed, before rust began production. 
That was the Yellowstone prequel, 1883. Seth Kinney was asked to provide props to that set as well. Bell Reed asked Seth to train actors and also to bring live reload ammunition. This was for actor training in what they called a cowboy camp before production started. He wanted to give them a sense of the recoil of the weapons they would be using on their production. This training with real ammo was done off set on a private gun range and they say did not make its way back to set on rust. And there was live ammo left over. Mr. Kinney testified it stayed in Texas and he's not sure exactly when he got it back to New Mexico, but did say it was between 50 and 100 live rounds that came back. He said he didn't have space available, so he put him in the bathroom. You guys have seen the photos of PDQ Warehouse. After the shooting, he got in touch with law enforcement, and he called Troy Teske, the one who turned in those rounds. Teske was actually storing ammunition for Hannah's dad in Arizona, and Seth asked if Bell Reed had any leftover reloads. Mr. Teske told Seth Kinney, no, he didn't. Teske sent a photo of four rounds and said this is what he could find. At the time, Seth thought they could be relevant to the investigation, but now he does not hold that same opinion. They show text between Teske and Seth where Seth is just essentially saying that Hannah's trying to blame everybody but herself. The prosecutor asked if these look the same as what was on the Rust set, and he says no. Now, later on, Corporal Hancock took the stand as well. She talks about Seth Kinney sharing a photo of ammunition with her. They talk about these text messages between Seth and Mr. Teske. She said, looking at the photos, she determined the rounds were not similar to what they found on set. She gave the example that some have a head stamp of companies like Winchester, and also their different colors. Corporal Hancock said she saw Mr. Teske at Hannah's trial and knew that he was a friend of Hannah's dad. Near the end of Hannah's trial, she got information about Mr. Teske coming in with the ammunition to the courthouse trying to turn them in. He actually spoke with deputies who were downstairs in that courthouse. She asked the deputy if he could have Teske wait until she could talk to him, but Corporal Hancock says he didn't wait. Later in the day, she got a call or text message that he came to the sheriff's office to turn in that ammunition. She explained her time was limited because she was in trial and she would make contact with him at a later time to get a statement and figure out what to do with this ammunition. He did leave some of that at the sheriff's office. She said she called him twice when she learned he went to the sheriff's office and he did not return her call and never has. There was body cam of the interaction with Mr. Teske. Corporal Hancock said she was never able to tie the ammunition Mr. Teske brought to the sheriff's office to the set of rust. The state was going to pass the witness, but then the judge had questions. And the judge says, you testified only one seemed similar to the Starline Brass Primer from Arizona. The witness says it was different in the primer color, and the judge asks how. Hancock says it's a brass color, and the ones from the rust set were silver. At this point, the judge tells counsel they need to come up to the bench, and they need to look at this. The judge says she sees one silver primer and asks the witness, none of these look similar to the ammunition on the set of rust, and the witness says not the live ammo. And the judge says, but it's similar to the ones on Rust. And she says, yes, regarding the dummies, not the live rounds. The judge asked, they're not similar to the live, but similar to the dummies. And she said, yes, the dummies were tested with the live ammunition by the FBI, but the witness cannot say which ones specifically were. On cross by the defense, you turn to the idea someone outside of the set of Rust could have been the source of the live ammunition. And then you interviewed Seth Kinney at least 10 times, and it would be a different case entirely if it was proven that Seth Kinney was the source of that live ammo. And the witnesses is hard to say. They ask if she's aware that there were 45 Starline brass rounds in the courtroom today, which were some of the ones handed over by Mr. Teske. The lead investigator said she just found that out that same day. This was kind of a big moment. The defense attorney reads from the transcript from crime scene technician Marissa a popple. The ammunition Teske gave, you still have it? She says yes. And you can bring it in here and show the jury and they can see it does not match the live ammunition on rust. 
Popple said yes. The defense attorney asked Corporal Hancock, was that testimony false? And she says yes. The defense says, you knew Mr. Teske was somewhat involved. He showed up during trial and went to the sheriff's office with ammunition that he says is matching to the ammunition that hit Ms. Hutchins. She says she doesn't think it was said it was matching. The defense says that's for law enforcement and the FBI to decide. She says also Teske didn't pick up the phone. The defense says it's not the first excuse because on direct, you said you didn't know it was related to the case. She says, well, how would I know if I wasn't given the opportunity to talk to him myself? He asked if there's any other evidence she's hidden from the defense, and she says she doesn't think she's hidden anything. By the way, Teske did give a full witness statement, and the lead investigator just learned of that on Friday the very day this whole thing was dismissed. On a redirect, at this point, the prosecutor is not doing well. You can tell she's very frustrated. She's interrupting the witnesses. She asked, was there any evidence the ammunition given by Mr. Teske was the same as the ammunition on set? Corporal Hancock says no. The prosecutor says, let me give the court an offer of proof and says she will testify under oath if the defense wants her to, because remember, Corporal Hancock told the judge that Prosecutor Morrissey was in on the conversation to put this ammunition under a different file number and also not with the rest of the rust evidence that they had in their possession. That's a huge deal. The judge asked Corporal Hancock if she went to the sheriff's office to look at the ammunition that Mr. Teske turned in, and she said no because she was in court for Hannah's trial. The judge said that she gets it, but Baldwin's case was still ongoing. The judge asked, was there a conversation to put the ammunition in a separate file? And was the prosecutor present for that? She says yes. This is a huge moment in this trial right there with that answer. At this point, Prosecutor Morrissey wants to get on the stand. And the defense, I think at this point, knows they don't need her to take the stand. But she insisted and marched up there and put herself on the stand. And she essentially gives just a verbal statement of her version of events during my investigation and review of the evidence in the case, I learned there was a large batch of ammunition in Thel Reed's possession. I also understood from all the evidence and testimony the ammunition Thel Reed has was taken by Thel and Seth to the 1883 Cowboy Training Camp, and then after that it was taken back to Seth's PDQ warehouse. Some was brought by Seth from that container and turned into the sheriff's office. It appeared to me he was trying to exonerate himself. It was logged under the Rust case. Law enforcement executed search warrants and took the entire container. I do agree, as I recall, the search warrant did not require law enforcement to take everything, but I understood he gave them everything to tag into evidence. Portions were sent to the FBI to be compared to the live ammunition found on the set of Rust, and the testing demonstrated the live ammunition from PDQ props did not match the live rounds from the set. She goes on to say Mr. Bowles, who is Hannah Gutierrez Reed's attorney, put Mr. Teske on a witness list in Hannah's trial. I conducted a pretrial interview with Mr. Teske, and I understanding he had contact with law enforcement regarding the rounds he still had in Arizona. These are rounds that never left Arizona. They were always in Thel and Teske's possession never went to Texas or New Mexico, and I understood Detective Hancock had communication with Teske about trying to get the rounds, and she was unable to. I didn't find that concerning because the rounds never left Arizona and Rust was filmed in New Mexico. The PDQ ammo went to different states. It was visibly dissimilar from the Rust ammo. In November of 2023, Hannah's attorney, again, has Teske on the witness list, and they did a pretrial interview in November of 2023 with Mr. Teske. He brought up he still had the live rounds that were Thel Reeds that never left Arizona. He indicated they were in the same batch from Joe Swanson, who is a supplier of dummy rounds. And I said, we should get them from you. I talked to Detective Hancock to figure out how to get the live rounds get a local law enforcement agency to pick them up and wondered if it was necessary since they never left Arizona. It was my impression they didn't match. She said she reached out to Hannah's attorney and they talked about whether the rounds should be tested by the FBI. She said she asked for photos of the rounds to see if they were similar and if I could connect with local law enforcement to get those. She goes on to say all six live rounds from the Rust set are identical. 
And when I talked to Hannah's attorney, he provided that photo for Mr. Teske at my request to see if it was related to the rust set. If it never left Arizona, the only way it's relevant is if it is similar to live ammo from rust. She goes on to describe the differences and says, one says Starline brass casing, but the projectile was different. The live rounds found on set had that Starline brass stamp on them. She decided not to collect the ammunition. It was in Arizona, in her opinion, didn't match the live rounds on the set. She goes on to talk about Mr. Teske being interviewed pre-trial, and you hear him say the defense attorney asked him to bring samples of the ammunition. Hannah's defense attorney said he didn't want them and would not use them and would not call Mr. Teske as a witness. He sat in court during trial and at some point told deputies downstairs, I have the ammunition after the defense attorney said no, tried to get Corporal Hancock, who wasn't available because she was with me, and he goes to the sheriff's office and leaves ammunition. She said she was contacted about Mr. Teske bringing the ammunition in, and Ms. Hancock said she would tag them into evidence and create a document report, and the prosecutor said... She responded, great. The prosecutor said she did not realize it wouldn't have the same case number. And then she shows the photos from Hannah's cell phone that shows the match to the live ammunition from the rust set. On cross, they point out that the prosecutor left the case today. The prosecutor says special prosecutor Johnson resigned and she didn't agree to have a public hearing. Prosecutor Johnson has gone public and said, that's not why I left. I left because I found out about all this at the same time the public did. The defense says you never turned over the report or evidence we're talking about. She said she didn't, but she didn't have a copy of the report. The rounds were left at the sheriff's office, and she has no reason to believe they're relevant because they never left Arizona. The defense says, but you didn't allow the defense to view that report that was made. And the prosecutor said I had never seen it myself, and I didn't know it wasn't under the same report number. She admits their star line brass, by the way. The defense asked if she called Baldwin names to a witness. And I mean, not nice names. I'm not going to get on it here. I try to keep it family friendly. She says, I don't know what you're talking about. The defense says, well, you said you would teach him a lesson. She says, absolutely not. The defense points out that their case would have gone in a different direction, starting with opening statements had they known about this. So we know that Judge Marlo Summers dismissed the case. In her decision, the judge explained that the prosecution suppressed evidence. The evidence was favorable to the accused and the evidence was material to the defense. She said there's no other way to remedy this and that case was dismissed. Now, after the case was dismissed, Prosecutor Carrie Morrissey talked to reporters and said there was absolutely no evidence that any of that ammunition was related to what happened on the set of Rust. She said she's disappointed because I believe the importance of the evidence was misconstrued by the defense attorneys, but I have to respect the court's decision. A lot of people wonder now, how could this affect Hannah Gutierrez's trial and conviction? I've watched a lot of legal analysts talk about this over the weekend, and I agree that her conviction is going to be revisited. The reason for that is her trial focused a lot on who brought the live rounds on the set of Rust. The state, their theory, it was Hannah. He is planning to file a motion. He said the judge found intentional misconduct and we also had the same failures in Hannah's case by the state. We will be moving for a dismissal of Hannah's case. He said the things he learned on Friday were shocking. Like I said, I've seen a lot of legal analysts say that they do feel this could be the way Hannah Gutierrez re gets out of prison because this actually was more relevant to her trial than really Alec Baldwin's. But the fact that they didn't turn this over to the defense and the fact they put this under a different case number, the judge had no choice. I mean, this had to be dismissed. We have constitutional rights, and this is a Brady violation where one side withholds evidence that could be exculpatory to a client. You get cases dismissed, and really, I mean, ultimately, the prosecution is the one that is to blame for what happened on Friday. And they could quite possibly be to blame if Hannah Gutierrez Reed gets dismissed because the one thing that courts and attorneys and everybody should do is protect the defendant's right to a fair trial. In this case, it looks like maybe both defendants that have been on trial didn't get a fair trial because of that withheld evidence. Love or hate Baldwin, it's the law. And it had to happen. I think it was the right call. So that's it. We'll see. We'll definitely be following any developments with Hannah Gutierrez-Reed. I know that Miss Hutchins' husband 
has spoken out and said he is still following up with the civil trial. I don't think we've heard the last of this by no means. I think there may be some hearings related to Hannah Gutierrez Reed. So we will definitely be covering that. In the meantime, I have filed a records request for Donna Adelson there in Florida, any sheriff's office records while she's been in their custody, including phone records showing who she's been talking to. Still haven't heard anything back on getting those actual phone calls, but still working on that. So this week, we're going to update on cases we've been covering that have kind of fallen by the wayside as we've been covering Daybell and now Baldwin. So look for that later this week. In the meantime, I hope you guys have a good rest of your afternoon. We will see you soon, y'all. It was a doozy Friday for sure.